turn with me to 1 Peter, chapter 2. Uh, it'll be in 1070, page 1075 in your uh, pew, uh, pew Bibles. All right, chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants, desire the pure milk of the word, so that you may grow up into your salvation, if you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone, Rejected by people, but chosen and honoured by God, you yourselves, as living stones, a spiritual house, are being built to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and honoured cornerstone, and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. So honour will come to you who believe. But for the unbelieving, the stone that the builders rejected, this one has become the cornerstone and a stone to stumble over and a rock to trip over. They stumble because they disobey the word. They were destined for this. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Now, this is the word of the Lord. Uh, in these final a uh, few verses of Peter's introduction to his letter. Uh, yes, after three sermons, we'll have only covered the introduction. Uh, he wants to reassure his readers of who they are in Christ. If they are chosen by God, but exiles, strangers and foreigners in the land they find themselves, what is their identity? Uh, that's what we're going to be looking at this morning. Uh, let's pray before we get stuck in. Uh, God of mercy, thank you that you have chosen us. Uh, you've chosen us uh, to be uh, your possession. Uh, help us to remember that that is uh, for a purpose, that we may proclaim your praises. Uh, help us to uh, take your word in uh, soak it into our hearts and apply it to our lives. Amen. Uh, so you'll find a, a sermon outline in your bulletins. Uh, so uh, follow along with that. So point one. Uh, I wonder uh, where uh, or how you would respond if I asked, where do you get your sense of identity? Uh, or similar, uh, how do you identify yourself? Uh, for myself, someone may say, well, he's a, a white, middle-aged, balding man. Uh, some might say still ruggedly handsome. <laughs> I know the ones who laughed. Uh, some might say, well, he's a nurse and a midwife. Uh, some might say, well, he's in pastoral ministry, he's got a family. Uh, I would like to, to identify as being in Christ, uh, being a son of God and a chosen possession. I wonder how you would identify yourself and where you find your identity. And depending on who you ask, our ethnicity... Uh, background, occupation, and family and friends uh, make up uh, our identity. Uh, external sources, 
Uh, some, however, will tell us that ex external sources don't actually define us at all, but that we ourselves define who we are. To those scattered throughout Asia Minor, strangers and exiles, Peter wants to remind his readers of their identity. They are not defined by ethnicity or social class or personal accomplishments, but rather by who they are in Christ and what he has achieved for them. Uh, so point two on the outline, uh, that's essentially what we've seen in the opening section of Peter's letter. Uh, that as God's chosen people, and because of his great mercy, he has given them new birth into a living hope through the life, death and resurrection of Christ, into an inheritance that is imperishing, undefiled and unfading. And we've seen that this should lead to a, re to a rejoicing people and that their lives should look differently. Uh, they should be a people who have set their hope completely on God's grace, are holy as God is holy, be conducting themselves in reverent fear of God and loving one another. Uh, these are all positive attributes and attitudes that God's people are to put on themselves and to display to others. Uh, but Peter now turns to what we must rid ourselves of. Uh, verse 1, uh, point 3 on your outline. Uh, Therefore, rid yourself of all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. All negative attitudes and attributes that tear down, that hurt, that create disunity within God's people. Now, did you notice that all these characteristics are communal in nature? Uh, they don't just affect the individual, they affect everyone. Now, Peter is saying that previously these things defined you before you were redeemed from your empty way of life. But that is not who you are now. Remember that you have been born again. So live in a way that reflects your new identity and grow up into your salvation. As Bernard mentioned last week, Peter leaves no doubt as to where we look to for our confidence and means of growth. Now, it's not to our own strength and ability, but rather to God and the abundance of mercy he has lavishly bestowed on us. Now, verses 2 and 3 help us understand what our natural instinct should be if we have received God's mercy and understand how utterly, amazingly good our God is. Now, verse 2 and 3 is the other side of the coin to chapter 1, verse 14. If you are no longer conforming to the desires of your former ways, you need to be conforming to God's desire for your life. And that comes through longing for, craving and desiring the word. Uh, this word that we've just heard described in verse 25 of chapter 1 as the gospel, the good news of Jesus. What we are called to crave is Jesus. Now, I'm assuming that most of us, if not all of us, have at one stage or another had contact with a newborn baby. Uh, they don't really do much do they? Uh, essentially, I, I, I could break it down to four things. Uh, they eat, they sleep, they fill a nappy, and for the most part, look cute. Maybe just not at two in the morning when they're not sleeping. Uh, they don't need any training uh, or coercing to feed normally. They have a literal gut instinct uh, that says, I'm hungry, I'm longing for milk. Uh, it's instinctual. Peter likens newborn, uh, believers to newborn infants. Uh, not in the same way that Paul describes believers in Corinth as immature, 
but rather as believers who, having experienced the goodness of God, uh, consistently and constantly return to his word as the source of life and comfort and joy. If we have tasted that the Lord is good, Peter says it should be our natural instinct to long for and crave after Jesus. Uh, Verse 4 is a helpful link to the next section as it explains what happens to those uh, or happens when we come to Jesus. Uh, But it also helps to clarify that this desire is not just a one-off, but something that we continually do. Uh, One commentator paraphrases it this way. As you continually come to Christ, the pure milk of the word, you yourselves are being built into a spiritual house. There is a craving for God that leads to growing in God. And this comes from tasting that the Lord is good. So let me ask you this. How many times have you been in God's word this week? Are you sitting daily at the feet of Jesus, letting him nourish you and sustain you, renew you and transform you? What is stealing your attention during the week? What are you craving? Is it Facebook or Philippians, Instagram or Isaiah? More money or Matthew and Mark? Acceptance or Acts? Prestige and power or wisdom through Proverbs? Romance or Romans? Safety and security or Samuel and the Psalms? Do we care more about worldly treasures or the treasures we find in God's word? Uh, Effectively, Peter is asking... Who are you being discipled by? Are you being discipled by the world and its values? Or are you being discipled by God and his word? Uh, Make no mistake, you are being discipled by someone or something. Your kids are being discipled by someone or something. Now, friends, where you get your discipleship from will dictate where you get your identity from. Peter is wanting his hearers, uh, those believers scattered throughout Asia Minor and those exiles dispersed throughout northwest New South Wales, to know where their identity comes from. Now, uh, knowing who your identity is in. Is, and where your identity comes from will form the foundation from which we can live out our lives in a hostile world as temporary residents. Now, the application of this uh, we'll see later on. Uh, so point four, uh, living stones in the new temple of God. Uh, So point one, uh, the first uh, section, changed lives and desires, uh, that's our craving. Peter moves now into growing. Now Peter, having laid out the importance of craving after Jesus, shows his readers that in coming to Jesus, drawing near to him, they are being built up and integrated into God's building project, the building up of his church as living stones. Peter picks up on an Old Testament passage and illustrations used by Jesus himself, language of living stones and, and the cornerstone. And he applies this to Jesus. Uh, having We saw it earlier applied in Acts. Uh, in one short sentence, Peter identifies believers with Jesus and Jesus as a better temple than the Old Testament temple. Now, whereas the Jerusalem temple was made of dead stone, Jesus is a living stone. Peter encourages his readers to view themselves as part of the new temple of God, and possibly even more radically, as holy priests who serve God 
through Jesus. Uh, the link between the previous section and this one should be clear. That having tasted God's goodness, we come to Jesus in personal devotion through the word. Uh, in verses 2 and 3, which increases corporate growth and integration into the church. In verses 4 and 5. Peter is showing that you cannot grow as a follower of Jesus in isolation or without God's word. Being connected to God's word and being connected to fellow believers is vital to Christian growth. Uh, Bernard mentioned uh, to us last week that Peter is talking to y'all. Uh, that is, he's talking to you all. It's not singular. Uh, it's in the plural. Uh, this is a team sport, not single player. Uh, earlier in the week, I caught a brief interview with Sam Kerr. Uh, if you're not sure who she is, shame on you. Uh, she's a footballer uh, with Australian, uh, the Australian Matilda squad, uh, one of the best soccer players, female soccer players in the world. Uh, the reporter was very quick to praise Sam, and she was very quick to, to shift the focus back to the team. Uh, the reporter only wanted to talk about Sam, how she felt she went, how she was feeling, how she was going. Sam only wanted to talk about how well the team had done and that she was only one part of the team. We don't come to Jesus in isolation, but we come in community. We don't follow Jesus without his word. Otherwise, we will continue to marinate in worldly desires in place of swimming in the life-giving waters of scripture. Uh, a final comment on this section. Uh, Peter supports his statements in verses 4 and 5 uh, with Old Testament scripture. Uh, for believers, there could be nothing more reassuring and comforting to know that whoever believes will be honoured for their faith and never put to shame. Whatever may happen to believers and whatever context they find themselves in, uh, and we'll see this in the next few weeks, ultimately there is no disappointment or embarrassment for those who trust in this sure cornerstone, Christ himself. Peter, however, makes clear that there will be those who stumble and trip over God's chosen and precious cornerstone. Uh, the language of stumble uh, is not so much accidentally fall, uh, but more of a will for desire to reject. They stumble and trip over God's chosen cornerstone. This occurs due to people actively rejecting Christ and disobeying God's word as God has destined them to do. Christ being the cornerstone which draws believers in and enables growth is at the very same time the cause for people to stumble and reject God. And we'll look at uh, some of the implications uh, later. Uh, so, ver uh, so point five on your outlines. Uh, we've seen how we are to crave Jesus. Uh, we've seen that we are to grow in Jesus. Uh, and Peter now shows or uh, explains to his readers that we are to show Jesus. As Peter finishes describing the state of unbelievers, he turns and gives a wonderful description of God's people. Uh, in quick succession, Peter lays out four identifying markers of God's people. Starting with verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. I just think about how beautiful and comforting these words must have sounded to Peter's original audience and to hearers throughout the ages. 
are people on the outskirts of society, people displaced from their earthly homes and country, people despised because of their faith in Jesus. What was once only true for the Israelites and to the exclusion of the Gentiles, like you and me, is now true of those who follow Jesus, no matter their ethnic background or their social status. At the start of their history, and we read uh, this in Deuteronomy 7, uh, there was nothing attractive about Israel. And they are described as the fewest of all people. And yet they were chosen to be God's own possession and a holy people belonging to God. Now followers of Jesus are placed in the magnificent timeline or storyline of God's redemptive purposes. Followers of Jesus, both Jews and Gentiles, have become the true Israel of God. Uh, So starting with verse 5, instead of a Jerusalem temple as God's dwelling place, Christians are now the new temple of God, continually growing as more put their faith in Christ. Uh, Previously, only the priesthood descended from Aaron could, ex- could offer acceptable sacrifices to God. But now Christians everywhere are the true royal priesthood with access to God's throne room, offering spiritual sacrifices. Now that is offering our bodies as living sacrifices to God that we hear in Romans 12. Now the giving of gifts to help the spread of the gospel in Philippians 14 or 4 and the singing of God's praises in Hebrews 13. God's chosen people are no longer said to be those of physical descent from Abraham. For Christians are now the true chosen race. The nation of Israel is no longer blessed by God. For Christians are God's holy nation, set apart and purified by Jesus. And now Christians, Jew and Gentile alike, are a people for his possession, called out of darkness into his marvellous light. Uh, Peter concludes with striking imagery drawn from Hosea, showing the incredible extent to which God has shown his mercy. Like Israel, when rejected by God, these Christians had at one time been no people and had received no mercy. Because of their sin, they were under the condemnation, deserving only judgment. Because of your sin and my sin, we were under condemnation, deserving only judgment. But now, Peter says, they as well as us, have been granted the highest privilege in the universe, being called God's people and having received mercy. Now, brothers and sisters, if you need a reason to rejoice first thing in the morning and a reason to rejoice at the closing of the day, dwell on these truths found in verses 4 to 10. Now, preach them to yourselves each day. Teach them to your children. Children, kids, perk up. This is for you. If your parents are not teaching you from the word of God, nag them. Ask them to read to you the Bible every day. And for all of us, remind each other of the graciousness and the excellencies of our magnificent God. Uh, Now, there is so much to unpack in these few verses, uh, but I want to draw out two important aspects of our new identity and two important implications. Uh, The first uh, point, all the blessings that create our identity as God's people are imparted to us, not because of any good in us or anything we have achieved, Uh, It's all because we come to Jesus, 
the pure milk of the word, the living cornerstone. Now, it's only through his precious blood shed on the cross for us that we are redeemed from our empty way of life, as Peter has explained in chapter 1. We can only rejoice in our new identity because God, who is rich in mercy, has given us new birth into a living hope. Where do we get our identity from? It is given to us by God through Jesus Christ, the enduring word of the Lord. Uh, the, the second important um, aspect, uh, therefore, our new identities is for something greater than ourselves. We are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation and a people for his possession. Not for our, not for our own self-gain or comfortable lifestyles, but that we may proclaim the praises of God. We are saved for his glorification and that his name would be great among the nations. So this brings us to two important implications for our identity. Uh, we're at point six on the outline. Uh, we're at point, the second point five on the outline. A first implication, as we, living stones, are connected to Jesus, our cornerstone, our future is safe and secure. We have a living hope through Jesus' resurrection. We have an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven. We are being guarded by God's power through faith. We are receiving the goal of our faith, the salvation of our souls. Because of this, we should be a rejoicing people, no matter what comes. Though we are exiles and strangers in this land, take comfort. Proclaim Christ boldly among our community and among the nations. To the one who believes in Christ, honour will come and they will never be put to shame. A second implication. As we, living stones, are connected to Jesus, our cornerstone, our time as living as exiles and strangers will not be easy. If the world rejects Jesus, it will reject those who follow him. Be prepared for suffering griefs of various trials, for being slandered, suffering for righteousness, and being ridiculed for the name of Jesus. But in those times, remember your true identity. God has imparted it to us. We are his chosen possession, deeply loved and cared for. And in those times, remember our purpose to faithfully proclaim the praises of the one who called us out of darkness into his marvellous light. Let's pray. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, we were condemned and rightly under your judgment. Uh, but because of your mercy, uh, we have uh, been brought into your family. We have become your chosen possession. Uh, once we had not received mercy, but now you have given us mercy. And once we were not a people, but now we are your people. And we praise and glorify you for this. Uh, Heavenly Father, as we uh, live as strangers and exiles in this world, uh, help us to remember our identity in you and our purpose to proclaim your name to whoever we can tell. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen.